Good morning, everyone. So we'll be switching gears from uh, left-sided heart failure to right-sided heart failure here. So um, just out of curiosity, how many programs ha uh, you know, take care of pulmonary hypertension here? So otherwise, predominantly, it's all uh, pulmonology driven in your programs. But you know, once you get into practice, you will be seeing more and more of these pH patients, mainly because uh, you know they get they get referred to you for echo, and then it's really important for you to recognize pH and um, also know at least how to take care of them and how to make an initial uh, diagnosis. So we'll go through these uh, definitions of pH and PAH, diagnostic algorithm, risk stratification, treatment algorithm, and recognition of acute RV failure and management of acute RV failure. So the ma recognition and acute RV failure and management uh, will be all encompassing, including you know patients who've had LVADs and uh, also people with pH. So uh, definition of pulmonary hypertension is, you know, is defined as, it's very simple, it's mean PA pressure or, uh, greater than 25 millimeters of mercury at rest by right heart catheterization. So you need uh, an invasive right heart catheterization to make a diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension. Though echocardiogram can be suggestive, you have to use uh, a right heart catheterization to uh, make uh, the diagnosis. Now pulmonary arterial hypertension is where your wedge pressure is less than uh, you know 15 millimeters of mercury and your PVR is greater than three woods units. So again, you know, you have to get all this data from um, right heart catheterization to make a diagnosis. Now, pulmonary vascular resistance, I'm sure uh, most of you are aware, you know, you, it is a calculated measure where you uh, subtract the mean arterial pressure from uh, the uh, wedge pressure and divide it by cardiac output to get uh, pulmonary vascular resistance. So uh, going through the classification of uh, pulmonary hypertension, so the WHO classification, the, the first class is where, uh, you know, you have pulmonary arterial hypertension where the wedge pressure is under 15 and your PA mean pressure is over 25 with a PVR of over 3. So this is what used to be called as primary pulmonary hypertension. And um, uh, again, this can be subdivided into idiopathic, heritable, and uh, those associated with connective tissue disease, HIV, portal hypertension, and uh, congenital heart disease. Uh, now, the most common cause of pulmonary hypertension is WHO group 2 pulmonary hypertension, which is left-sided heart disease driven. So these are patients who have uh, elevated wedge pressure and you know what used to be called as sort of post capillary pulmonary hypertension is is uh, this who group 2 pulmonary hypertension now these in the recent uh, guidelines has been subdivided into two groups where you look at what used to be called as out of proportion who group 2 pulmonary hypertension has been renamed as combined pre and post capillary pulmonary hypertension and uh, for this, you really look at the diastolic pressure gradient, where you look at the gradient between the PA diastolic and the wedge pressure. And if that gradient is over 7, then you have combined pre and post capillary pulmonary hypertension. And uh, the uh, patients who do not have it just have passive, uh, you know, um, who group to pulmonary hypertension. Now, likely with the data coming out with diastolic uh, pressure gradient, that is likely to change in the near future. So, sorry, uh, the, the uh, who group three is, is pulmonary hypertension associated with uh, lung disease. So the, these are patients who've had uh, ILD or COPD and uh, patient, these patients who have uh, increased PA pressures along with that. So who group four pulmonary hypertension is chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. These are patients who've had a history of PE or uh, at least who've had some uh, clots in the pulmonary um, uh, arterial tree and then go on to develop pulmonary hypertension because of that. And uh, who group five are really sort of the miscellaneous causes where you have unclear multifactorial mechanisms like hematologic disorders and splenectomies and chronic renal failure, fibrosing mediastinitis causing pulmonary hypertension. Now, epidemiology of uh, pulmonary hypertension, again, this is an echo-based study. So as you can see here, you know, um, only even though uh, about 10% of the patients having an echocardiogram, uh, 
uh, and uh, have pulmonary hypertension, only 2.3% of them have a pH after full evaluation. So there is another French registry where uh, the incidence of PAH is around 5 to 8 per million um, per year. Uh, now, we, let's, you know, somebody gets referred to you for dyspnea on exertion and you get an echocardiogram and, uh, you know, how, uh, where do you go from there? Your echocardiogram shows that, you know, there's a calculated systolic PA pressure of over 40. So what, what are the other things to think of? So uh, you on the echocardiogram, you look at both the right and the left side and see whether the patient has you know, signs of LV, diastolic, or systolic heart failure, like we you know, just discussed. The most common cause for pulmonary hypertension is left-sided heart disease. So if patients have a large left atrium, patients have signs of diastolic dysfunction or systolic dysfunction, likely that pulmonary hypertension is coming from the left-sided heart disease. Now, uh, and again, on history, if they have severe COPD or severe ILD, you know, so you know that the pulmonary hypertension is coming from that. Now, if patients do not have any of that, and it is appearing that, uh, or at least that uh, the, the, the findings on the echo are sort of out of proportion, um, to the level of pulmonary hypertension seen on echo, then you go down the algorithm and look at other things like, uh, uh, you know, a VQ scan to look for uh, chronic thromboembolic pH, and then, um, uh, and then you almost always, uh, at least our practice is, has been to, if you're having dyspnea on exertion and you have uh, features of pulmonary hypertension, to get a right heart cat so that you can subdivide these patients into, um, you know, who group one or who group two uh, appropriately. Um, now, again, this is just a reiteration of, uh, uh, you know, what are the causes which uh, leads to PAH. Um, now, going through, you know, what are the um, pathways. So, in the 90s, the only approved uh, medication uh, for pulmonary hypertension were, you know, prostacycline. So, it affected the prostacycline pathway, which essentially, uh, you know, works on the uh, CAMP and causes vasodilation and decreased smooth muscular endothelial proliferation. Uh, the second drug to be uh, approved was, uh, you know, in this pathway, the, the endothelin pathway, where um, it essentially um, uh, blocks both endothelin uh, receptor A and B, and a, again, this uh, decreases vasoconstriction and proliferation. Um, and uh, the third um, pathway that uh, is really active in, in causing pulmonary hypertension is the nitric oxide pathway, which again, most of you are aware of, you know, sildenafil and tadalafil, which uh, really uh, inhibit the uh, PDE5, which uh, increases uh, CGMP and causes vasodilation. Now, in the, in the last two years, there has been another medication which uh, has been approved, which works on soluble guanylate cyclase stimulator, which again increases CGMP and uh, causes vasodilation. It's, uh, the medication is called Riosequat. Uh, now, how do you decide on you know, what treatment to use? Really, it depends on the presentation of the patient. If the patient presents to you with uh, you know, function class two or three symptoms with uh, not much of RV failure, then you tr start off using o oral therapies. Uh, now, if somebody presents to you with class four symptoms with bad RV failure, multiple admissions to the hospital, these are the patients that you need to consider IV therapies in. Um, now, the one thing here is uh, in pulmonary hypertension, um, uh, it's the we use WHO class instead of NYHA class, and it's very similar to NYHA class except for the addition of syncope and presyncope. So, if patients have uh, syncope, then they are class four, and if they have presyncope, they have class three. Uh, but other than that, you know, the, the dyspnea on exertion is very similar to NYHA class. Um, again, uh, there has been a recent trial about two years ago called Ambition, which uh, looked at whether combination initial therapy with uh, an endothelial receptor antagonist and a PDA5 was uh, 
compared with uh, standalone PDE5 and uh, an endothelial receptor antagonist. And dual upfront therapy was shown to be beneficial in terms of both uh, improving uh, um, six minute walk distance and also decreasing uh, morbidity or uh, mainly driven by uh, RV failure related hospitalization. So now the recommendation is really for us to start dual oral therapy if we are considering patients for starting oral therapy. Now again, you know, uh, like I was saying, you really have to look at, uh, you know, whether patients are in low risk or high risk and then decide what to do, uh, what treatment to choose. And uh, uh, really, as I uh, reiterated uh, earlier, you know, cl clinical evidence of RV failure, uh, which is evidenced by edema uh, um, and hepatojugular reflux, uh, hepatomegaly, uh, ascites, then they're at higher risk of not doing well. Who class four uh, patients won't do well, and again, six minute walk distances, less than 300 meters, these patients don't do well. Uh, uh, BNP, which are very elevated, and echocardiographic evidence of RV failure. Um, this was a, a recent risk score which was developed uh, using a large revealed uh, registry uh, in patients uh, mainly with PAH to see who's going to do well and who's not. Again, these uh, combine um, um, features of RV failure uh, essentially and um, both by uh, exercise testing and right heart catheterization. Um, and, and patients who uh, you know, have poor signs of uh, RV function uh, on, on, on different measures uh, are, are great, uh, get more points and are at uh, high, higher risk of not doing well. Now, switching gears here, so we'll talk a little bit about acute RV failure. So I, um, you know, the, the acute RV failure, there is no real definition other than Intermax definition, which is really borrowed from patients who've had uh, LVAD. So, but it is fairly generalizable to, uh, you know, patients who don't have LVADs as well. So again, patients who have CVP over 18 and cardiac index under two, and in the absence of uh, any um, LV, um, uh, dysfunction uh, evidenced by increased wedge pressure, tamponade, or ventricular arrhythmia, or, uh, or pneumothorax. So again, you know, the, these patients uh, oftentimes uh, end up requiring RVADs or inhaled NO or inotropic therapy for more than a week at the time of, uh, after LVAD implantation. Now, again, like I said, you know, that, that, that was... Um, uh, severe RV, uh, severe har RV failure was patients who are requiring RV implantation and patients who have moderate uh, RV dysfunction are patients who require inotrope and uh, patients who have uh, mild RV failure are the ones who meet two out of the four uh, criteria here. Now when we are looking at acute RV failure, the most uh, common causes are really post-cardiotomy shock, post-LVAD, uh, post-bypass, post-mitral valve surgery, acute pulmonary embolism, acute RV infarction, and decomposited pulmonary hypertension. Uh, now, pathophysiologic mechanisms, again, you know, it depends on why patients have RV failure. If you're coming in with PEs, then it's due to uh, pulmonary or myocardial, micro, you know, mycothrombi depending on whether you have PE or RV infarct. And um, um, again, you know, it leads to a cascade of inflammatory uh, pathways which lead to uh, uh, myocardial dysfunction. So when you're looking at, uh, you know, treating RV failure, you have to determine etiology, look at why they have uh, RV failure so that you can treat them appropriately. Now, if you have, if they have RVMI, then you take them to the cath lab and you know do primary PCI. If they have PEs, you look at thrombolysis, uh, and then uh, if you have, uh, you know, it's post cardiotomy, then you need to look at why they're having that. Maybe the the graft went down, and you know you need to look at revascularization there. Now, general principles for a treatment of uh, shock due to uh, RV failure preload optimization, so uh, their optimal CVP once they have RV failure is around 10 to 12, but you know, so if they're uh, 
dry and if their CVP is 5, then it's, it's okay to give them judicious volume. But again, you have to be really careful not to overload them. So in these circumstances, it's really useful to have a Swan-Gans catheter so that you can have targeted and guided management of RV failure. Um, and if the patients uh, do not improve with that, then you really are looking at starting uh, an inotrope. Uh, most uh, preferred inotrope in this setting is either dobutamine or uh, milrinone, depending on whether patients have uh, hypotension or not. Now, if you're looking at somebody with pulmonary arterial hypertension, then uh, you really need to decrease that pulmonary vascular resistance. So look at using a pulmonary vasodilator, whether it's in inhaled or IV format. Uh, and uh, then uh, if the patient's in uh, atrial tachyarrhythmia, then you know, considering cardioversion is appropriate in this setting. Uh, now, again, you should uh, use protective ventilation because when you have high PEEP and if your plateau pressures are very high, then the RV does not like high PEEP, so minimize PEEP. And avoid acidosis, hypoxia, and hy uh, hypercarbia because all of these are potent pulmonary vasoconstrictors. Uh, again, we, we talked about the correctable causes. And you know, inhaled nitric oxide is sort of our go-to drug in, uh, in this circumstance so that because one, it's, uh, um, yeah, you don't have to uh, really worry about VQ mismatch when you're using uh, inhaled nitric oxide, and it's probably the most potent pulmonary vasodilator that's out there. So uh, that's sort of our go-to drug. In case your institution does not have it, then using inhaled Flolan is probably reasonable, uh, except the only thing you have to watch out for is that it, in, it can cause increased wedge pressure in some pulmonary edema if you don't unload the LV. Um, again, you know, we've talked about the inotropes. Again, if they're not responding to inotropes and you have to use a vasopressor, then uh, the go-to uh, there is probably, you know, uh, vasopressin. Now, norepinephrine does have some pulmonary vasoconstrictor properties, so I would avoid using uh, norepinephrine. Um, now, coming to mechanical circulatory support in these patients, uh, it's really important to know whether the lungs are involved or not. If your PVR is very high, then an RVAD will not work in these patients because it has to really work against a lot of resistance. And most often in, in patients who've had high PVR, these are patients who've had pulmonary arterial hypertension and it's also associated with hypoxia. So in those patients, ECMO should be your, you know, your go-to um, uh, consideration. And now, um, I think uh, probably Jerry uh, spoke about uh, uh, Impella and, no, not yet. So, uh, <laughs> not the Impella RP. So, um, this is the Impella RP where um, what it essentially does is it uh, bypasses the, uh, the RV. So, in cases of acute RV MI, uh, you can use this to sort of rest the RV. Now, here, um, this is put in through the groin, and um, um, this is the inflow, and this is the outflow. It, so it sits in the, just uh, around the bifurcation in the LPA. Uh, and um, this can provide good uh, amount of three and a half, four liters of flow. Now, uh, it's a little bit easier to put in, uh, I guess, in, in patients who've had acute MI who don't have a remodeled RV, but in patients who have a large RA and a large RV, this can be quite challenging to put in. This is how you know it, it looks like. And uh, um, this is uh, the tandem heart. Again, um, uh, as uh, Dr. Eastep spoke about, uh, you know, this uh, involves crossing the uh, uh, crossing the septum and uh, the outflow is in the left atrium and the uh, inflow is, uh, I'm sorry, the inflow is in the left atrium and the outflow um, uh, uh, in the uh, femoral artery or in the aorta. Um, now this can be pulled back and sort of uh, you can have uh, inflow from the right atrium and uh, you, you can convert it into a VA ECMO if needed. Now, uh, this is uh, ECMO again, like Dr. Eastep spoke about. This is the, the go-to in patients who have pulmonary arterial hypertension so that you can provide both ventricular support and oxygenation. 
So again, uh, in conclusion, you know, uh, pH should be uh, often considered in your differential when patients have unexplained dyspnea. Uh, and your first screening tool is an echocardiogram, and if you see that uh, the uh, pH pressures are over 40, then right heart cath should be considered in you know all of these patients so that you can differentiate what kind of pulmonary hypertension they have and. Uh, uh, and so that it can help you in treatment as well. Right. Thank you very much.